Good afternoon. I'm Greg Allen, the director of the AI Governance Project here at CSIS. And today we've got a terrific guest, uh, a member of the European Parliament, Mr. Dragos Tudorake, who is the co-rapporteur of the European Union's AI Act, a landmark piece of legislation still in negotiation at the European Union, but that would be the first of its kind as a horizontal AI regulation. Uh, Member Tudorake, thank you for joining us here today at CSIS. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so before we launch into the, to the meat of your work as a parliamentarian, I wanted to ask you just a bit about your own background. Uh, how did you come to be working at the European Parliament on AI issues? Well, I'm a lawyer by profession, and certainly I'm not a, I don't know mu that much about the, the technicalities of AI. But I remember a couple of years ago, uh, way before I, I, I came to Parliament, I was working for the, for the Romanian government as the Minister of Interior. And I read an article about AI and about how AI is going to change our societies, our economies, and also, very interestingly, how it's going to change government. And how, in fact, our states, our governments will have to learn to actually become themselves some sort of platform states because of the way they're going to have to deliver services to a society that will expect that kind of services to come in that form from their governments. And I thought that's an interesting, that is an interesting thought, and I think that this is something that is going to shape a lot of the work uh, politically that we will do in the future. Then, of course, came the, the um, shifts uh, in, in terms of, of geopolitics uh, in the world and the increasing importance of technology in the global conversations and all this led me at the start of the mandate two and a half years ago to setting as an objective uh, AI and also the crossroad between again geopolitics and our interests as a union uh, and the way we'll interact with with like private partners like the US uh, and technology so uh, the work started in fact with the establishment of a special committee on artificial intelligence and I very much pushed for the establishment of that committee and then I chaired that committee, it was called AIDA, which was a good place to educate ourselves as legislators on what AI was, what AI is, and actually understand the deep effects of AI, but also how it interacts in different sectors with the uh, current way of doing business, let's say. And from that work then uh, came the moment when the Commission has put forward the proposal for the AI Act, and then uh, I have uh, pitched to be the rapporteur for that, and this is where we are right now, uh, in the middle of the negotiations, for what, as you rightly said, will be the first piece of horizontal legislation regulating AI in the world. Great. So here in the U.S., AI regulations in the, in the previous White House administration, the actual direction that came from the White House was to approach AI regulations with a light touch. And then on top of that, that regulatory approach has been entirely within the executive branch. There hasn't been a major regulatory initiative at the legislative mm -hmm. branch. And so that means that our regulations are based more on sector specific. So the Department of Transportation is involved in regulating autonomous vehicles. The Department of the Treasury might be involved in regulating AI in the use of finance. But the EU is going after a horizontal approach. So what does that mean and, and how is it your hope for that it will play out in the, in the EU AI Act? In fact, I think the, the moment that the Commission started preparing itself mentally for <laughs> regulating AI, I think initially they also looked at the tradition that we had in having product safety sectorial legislation and they kind of thought of taking a similar approach. But I think the, the, the way also the discussions in other multilateral fora uh, were evolving in terms of producing general principles on AI, I think that's when the Commission realized that the better approach would be this sort of horizontal, risk-based approach. Um, and I happen to believe that this is the right way of, of regulating at, at, at this stage. And then, right now, what you have is a bit of a blend. Uh, in fact, the text is a bit of a hybrid between the approach that the Commission has taken so far in dealing with product safety and this sort of horizontal, risk-based uh, setting of rules, of generic rules, to apply across the board, but for specific use cases in, in, in different domains. So it's, a, it's certainly an innovation, uh, which of course makes the, the negotiations even more of a challenge, but I am confident the, the final product will be something that would help set a course 
and hopefully, if we work well, and if we also work well with our like-minded partners, would also be a good model for how we write rules of AI also at, uh, at the world stage. So the current draft of the EU AI Act is, you know, undergoing amendments and a negotiation process, and then you, you've got an entire uh, set of contentious debates that we'll dive into a little bit later. But what is the sort of basic mechanism uh, of the EU AI Act? Can you break it down for us? You talked about a risk-based approach. Well, I think the, the best way to, to imagine it is imagine a pyramid. Uh, imagine a pyramid of risk, basically. We have at the bottom about, let's say, 80 to 90 percent of all AI, which in fact is case regulation. So it's not regulated. It's not regulated. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, most of the applications will continue to, to exist as they exist right now when the legislation is not in place. And what, what, what would qualify something to go into this low risk, not regulated category? So as long as your AI does not affect the interests of individuals, I think it's all uh, the human centric approach is basically the key word and the key logic that the commission has applied. So it's all about the interests of, of individuals, uh, human rights, the values that more or less underpin our union. Um, and as long as you're not touching those interests, therefore, you should not be regulated. That's why the Commission has taken this sort of uh, risk-based approach. So we've got a, a pyramid of risk, and it's risks to human rights and human safety. Exactly. And low-risk items are excluded. What, what would go into the moderate risk, high risk, unacceptable risk Yeah, so let's, let's start with the, with the tip of the pyramid. So at the tip of the pyramid, you have that AI that is, that is touching so fundamentally uh, upon the rights of individuals that we should simply not have them at all. At least that's how we Europeans think. And that's where you have uh, manipulation, uh, using uh, subliminal techniques as the commission uh, to manipulate uh, human behavior. Uh, you have, and that's a long and, and very difficult conversation that mm -hmm. we will have on the use of uh, biometric technology in, in public spaces mm -hmm. um, uh, with so some exceptions like real for time facial recognition or something in, like that. In public spaces. That's in public spaces by yeah. public agencies. Yes. Correct, yeah. um, so these are the, and now we're adding also predictive policing, uh, which is also going to be quite an interesting uh, ideological debate on whether they should be part of the prohibited practices or not. Mm -hmm. So in this tip of the, of the pyramid, you have these applications that we should simply not have at all. So mm -hmm. if you want to develop applications, put them in, in, uh, on, on the market in the European Union, it should not be possible. Mm -hmm. Then the second floor, you have the high risk applications. And the Commission is, in its proposal in an annex, in fact, and I'll explain why they're in an annex, uh, identify several sectors where if you develop AI in those sectors, again, because the likelihood of touching upon the interests of individuals is very high, mm. then they could qualify as high risk. And as a result of that, you'll have to go through certain compliance requirements. And that goes into certain documentation that you will have to have, certain obligations of transparency, you'll have to put it in a, in a European wide database, you'll have to explain the, the underlying elements of that algorithm to, to the user. So requirements that would make that high risk not outside the law, so it's not bad AI, but again because of its impact or potential impact on the uh, rights of individuals, it will have to be better explained, it will have to be more transparent in the way it works and the way the algorithm actually plays out its effects. Then you have a third smaller floor in the pyramid, which are not high risk, but they are applications that do require certain level of transparency. Mm -hmm. For example, deep face. That's the example that actually is being given as a use case by the Commission's proposal. And there, again, the requirements are lower than for the high risk, but still it requires certain explainability, certain transparency uh, to comply with. And then you have, as I said, the vast majority of applications that will go in the lower part that will not be regulated at all. Great. So this approach really goes not sector specific, but application specific and category yes. of application specific. Now you've got these regulations that has different requirements for different types of applications. Who would be enforcing these regulations and, and how? In the proposal of the Commission, the enforcement is left to national authorities. So each member state should establish or designate an existing authority that will be responsible with the application with the enforcement of the text. I happen to believe that this is a model that should not 
<laughs> happen mm -hmm. for the simple reason that it will fragment the application, the enforcement, it will inject incoherence in the way uh, these rules would be applied and also it will bring a lot of insecurity in the market for those developing AI mm -hmm. and that's the one thing and the one big objective that at least I have as a liberal politician which is that we don't stifle innovation, that we encourage innovation and that we also allow companies to play out the effects of the digital single market and you cannot have that mm -hmm. if you end up with 27 different regulators applying, interpreting the same rules. You don't want some company being advised by a German regulator, oh if you do it this way it's completely fine and then discovering from a French regulator actually exactly. you're now subject to a exactly. bunch of liabilities even though they're both enforcing the same law. Exactly. So that's your, your goal for centralization. And exactly. then you've also talked about a, a body that would be created to work on this. Can you elaborate a bit on that approach? Yeah, my proposal in my amendments to the text was to establish what would be called an European uh, AI center. We can, the name is less <laughs> yeah. uh, important. Uh, the competences of such a, an office are important. And there, uh, the key uh, element of such a governance is that, again, it would, from there, uh, ensure uniform uh, application of the law, uniform um, uh, enforcement of the law, with the presence, of course, in a board of all the member states, because that's important to have, of course, the member states represented there, but also, very importantly, with the presence of stakeholders. I think that in a governance of uh, a technology such as AI that is going to constantly evolve, we will need to be able to keep legislation as close to the reality of that technology as possible. And the only way to do that is if you have at the table of the decisions, uh, when you make decisions, you have those stakeholders that are either working in developing that technology as well as those that represent the users, those that feel the effects of the technology. So for me, having the stakeholders around the table when decisions are made, when decisions about the amendment of the legislation are made, because I was explaining earlier the whole logic of keeping the use cases for high-risk AI in an annex, that allows, and is meant to be that way, it allows for a constant adaptation to the realities of the market and of the evolution of technology of the legislation. The only way you can actually properly keep that annex in sync with reality is if you have, again, those that work with technology uh, at the decision-making table. So that's the kind of governance that I'd like to see. Now for the AI Act, but I think it's also the kind of uh, governance that we need in Europe for everything else that is right now being produced in terms of dig digital legislation because, again, if you'll have different boards for the different, for the Digital Services Act, for the Digital Markets Act, for the AI Act, again, it's not going to help companies, it's not going to help users, it's not going to help authorities either. And then there's one last element which I think is important, which is expertise. It's not simple for the public sector to attract the right level of talent and retain the right level of talent to actually have the ability to understand what happens uh, out there, um, to be able to interact properly with the stakeholders and speak the same language. If you, again, would allow or you would leave this to the 27 different governments to be able to fight for that expertise and secure it at national level, I don't think it's going to, 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 to work out. So only by creating this sort of centralized governance at the European level, we can actually compete with the private sector in attracting the right level of talent in, in, in this body. Yes, I mean, in my own experience working for the United States government, we found it was incredibly hard uh, to attract and retain you know, the sort of sufficient critical mass of talent that you require in this extremely complicated field that is evolving so rapidly. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're working on regulatory mechanisms that are not set it in stone and then revisit it, you know, a decade and a half later, you've got something that is actually built into the design that it can be updated in real time Precisely. based on the outcome. Now, I think this is sort of relates to the, the lessons learned that you've taken away from GDPR, the sort of landmark European privacy and data legislation, which is now six years old. So can you talk a little bit about how the experience of GDPR informed the way that you designed the AI Act? Mm -hmm. Well, I think governance probably is the, the place to start because if we look at the, uh, at the practical implications of GDPR and how it worked for the companies out there, you actually had very different experiences from one member state to another. Uh, because it's linked to the, to the administrative culture in each member state, to how each authority understands its role uh, with regard to, to the, let's say, the subjects of the law. And therefore, again, uh, very different experiences from one member state to another. Second, 
If you were a company that were playing, again, out on several member states at the same time, you were ending up with uh, very different interpretations of actually what you do right and what you do wrong. And again, that's not something that helps out the whole cross-border element of what the digital market is all about, in fact. Yeah, because Europe has been, for a long time, really sort of looking for their own technology giants, their really successful corporations. And it's really hard to grow up in the European market and achieve economies of scale if there's actually no similarity amongst all these different common markets. You know, the economies of scale depend upon a common regulatory framework. Exactly. So you've, you've built a lot into this legislation that um, is designed to not stifle innovation, which is the classic criticism uh, you know, that you make here in the United States against Europe, is that they only know how to regulate, they don't know how to innovate. But yeah. you've built mechanisms in this legislation that are designed not to hamper innovation. Um, we've talked about uh, the sort of common approach as opposed to the fragmented approach. We've uh, talked about the, how 90% of applications are excluded. Is there anything else that you would highlight in the design of the legislation that's designed to continue fostering innovation and ensure that regulation doesn't hamper it? Mm -hmm. I would start with the precision of the norm because I think that's important. I think the, the more precise we'll manage to, to write the definitions, to write the carve-outs, the application, the exceptions, the more will help actually uh, industry to innovate in those areas that will be clear for them that they are not covered by the legislation. But probably the most important element is sandboxes. Um, that's a concept that already existed in, in the initial commission proposal. but a bit of an afterthought uh, somewhere in the text. And in Parliament, we're trying now, and I'm, I'm very much pushing for that, we're trying to elevate that concept uh, so that it really represents uh, the kind of needed test bed to allow innovation to happen, to encourage innovation, to encourage companies to come forward and actually test out their ideas in an environment that is free of, of risk of error in a way. Not because you cannot uh, make mistakes, but that mistakes would be allowed because they're in interacting with the regulator. You can test out your ideas and make sure that at the end of the process you are compliant with the application that you develop. And I think- Can you, can you just uh, give an example of like, what is a company, what, is, what kind of sandbox environment would they go into and what is, how does the company benefit, how does the government benefit from this sandbox approach? Yeah. So in the current logic that we're trying to apply to, to the way we'll draft the definitions and the roles of the, of the sandbox, we want the sandboxes to be, number one, a place to test, number two, a place to achieve compliance, and number three, a place that will elevate the lessons learned from that experience and that interaction between the company and the regulator to the governance, what I was mentioning earlier, so that the governance can actually be informed of the realities that the companies are faced with when actually trying to comply. And then when they adapt the rules, they adapt them in a way that it makes sense. So, so what happens, I'm company A. So I'm company A and I want to develop AI, right? In an area that I feel either because I know that I'm targeting an, a domain that is right now in the list of, of high risk, or I think that, hmm, my application and the kind of data that I'm going to put in and the kind of scope that I want to give to this application might actually be in one of the risk categories in the legislation. Uh, and maybe I can afford to do compliance exercises inside my own company because I'm a big company and I have a whole army of lawyers or compliance officers or, or I'm not. But even if I am, I will still feel safer if I go and interact with the regulator and actually ask questions there, I play out my scenarios there, and again, in a direct interaction with the regulator, in an environment that is, again, is a free for trial and error, mm -hmm. I can actually arrive to a product that gives me the confidence that I can put it on the market and I'm compliant with the rules and I'm not breaking any uh, of, of uh, or I'm not uh, materializing any of the risks. So um, that's the kind of environment that I see for a sandbox. And for that to work, and that's also something that we, we are pushing for in the negotiations for the text, uh, you will need to have these sandboxes uh, pretty much everywhere. So we are advocating for a rollout of these sandboxes at national level, but also at regional, at municipal level. We want cross-border sandboxes in a way that gives accessibility 
to these sort of testing environments to big or small to from the young engineer with a bright mind who wants to go and play out uh, his or her idea in a safe environment to again a company that otherwise maybe could afford compliance but would feel safer doing that uh, in a direct interaction with the regulator. So that's the kind of environment that we see uh, fit for encouraging innovation and achieving that objective that we otherwise always say we want, which is to actually have our own uh, tech uh, companies uh, thrive in, in Europe and, and, uh, and develop such technologies. So in the United States, uh, regulatory sandboxes have been a big driver of technology innovation, but usually it's starting from a high threshold of regulation, and then the sandbox is a place to experiment with a reduced level of uh, regulation. So for example, um, autonomous cars are banned, or at least were banned, on many roads in the United States, but states like Arizona or municipalities like San Francisco adopted sort of unique regulatory sandboxes whereby autonomous vehicles were allowed as long as sort of agreed upon safeguards were in place. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what, can you take us a little bit deeper into the European sandbox? What is an industry that might benefit from a sandbox and, and how would they use it? Well, I think pretty much any industry could, could uh, find uses that actually interacting in a sandbox, and, and if I am to take your example, it could work both for scaling up and scaling down. Mm. So you can be in a sector that is already identified as, as high risk. So almost by default, anything that you would want to produce there would be high risk. But you might actually, by going in and playing out your scenarios and testing your application in the sandbox, you might discover actually that you can scale down the need of compliance and the requirements that you have to, to abide with mm -hmm. simply because when you test it and when you interact with the regulator you realize that actually what you do uh, is not reaching that, that threshold of risk as the regulation is, is, is imagining it or scaling up. So you come in with your idea uh, whether you're in the human resources management sector or whether you're in the I don't know critical infrastructure management a sector, whether in the education sector, doesn't matter in which sector you are, again, you can also scale up. You go in thinking, hmm, ah, maybe, maybe there is a little bit of a risk in what I'm doing because I'm doing a software and algorithm that is going to help, I don't know, banks to analyze credit uh, risks for, for clients. So maybe there is something that is a, a risk element in there, but I want to see, I want to, again, put the scenario forward with the regulator and then test a bit and see how this application would, would work. And then you realize that, in fact, you would get uh, to the kind of effects that would require you to go through the compliance mechanism, and therefore you have to scale up uh, what you do. So I think in both, in both ways, scaling up and scaling down, the sandbox can help every industry in every sector uh, feel better about coming onto the market with these products uh, in terms of, of uh, being compliant with the, with the future regulations. Great. And the AI value chain is incredibly complicated. You've got all the way on the right the people who are actually providing the service to the end user, which might be an application developer or you know, a, a computer software provider, or maybe something more industrial in nature. And then all the way over here, you know, we've got the people who are making the raw silicon chips, right, that are driving all of this AI. And then you've got everybody in between who might be producing training data sets. They might be producing uh, AI models that then a sort of another company will customize. So who in the AI Act gets regulated and, and why? I think it's very important to retain this, this aspect, this whole risk-based approach. Mm -hmm. So that means that it's only by, by producing that, that potentiality of risk that you come under the scope of the regulation. And only by allocating a certain purpose to your AI mm -hmm. that you're coming under the scope of that regulation. So I'm allocating a purpose, and that purpose is uh, prone to risk. And that's when I come into the tip of the pyramid in one of the three floors. Which means that along the value chain, as long as what I do number one is actually not yet hitting the market because I'm only doing a, a, the beginning or, the, or, or code that then needs to be taken, trained with data to then become something. So I'm only the producer of that code. 
Is that code on the market? Is it producing any effects? No. Then I'm regulation free. The moment that code is taken and then fed with data by someone else mm -hmm. and then affected to a particular purpose and that purpose is producing a risk that is listed in the regulation, it is that entity that has fed the data, that has done, it's a concept that we, we are introducing now in the text of significant change. You are basically introducing a significant change to that algorithm, mm -hmm. to that initial machine, and it's therefore there where the liability in that chain is going to move. Okay, so just, just to walk through you know, how you're thinking about this, um, if you're imagining a computer vision AI application, so this is something that basically starts with video camera data and uh, you know, outputs some kind of understanding of what's going on in that video camera. You could imagine using this for uh, an industrial control application. You want to uh, look at parts and automatically determine whether or not they are too rusted to continue being used in this or something like that. So you've got the company that sort of makes, I just make generic computer vision uh, software, and then the, another company you're envisioning will take that sort of generic AI computer vision software and add to it this sort of unique understanding of industrial component rust, and then they will sell that to the end user, which might be a factory operator or a power plant operator or somebody who cares about this rust problem. So sort of three actors in the system. The more general provider of uh, AI, the deployer, deployer or the customizer of the AI system who is actually selling it to the end user who is actually deriving value from using the AI application. Mm -hmm. And in your mind, the, the sort of correct person to be regulated in this scenario is that middle party, the person who is making it application specific and bringing it to market. Is that correct? Yes. Only that in your particular example, in fact, all three escape regulations simply because what they do is they play with industrial AI, what I call industrial AI. <clears throat> and I'm actually fighting to introduce such a filter in, in the text so that industrial AI, i.e. in your case, it is looking at shelves or it is looking mm -hmm. at rusted piece and it's going to help me optimize the way I'm actually, whatever, arranging my production flows in my company. There, you're not impacting in any way the interests of individuals, you're not playing with personal data and therefore there is AI for industrial use and that in fact should escape regulation. And, and it's in not the, because uh, what industry does doesn't matter for safety or no. human rights. It's because there's an existing regulatory regime for industrial Absolutely. production, which you believe that should be the starting point for that. Exactly. So you're mo mostly focused on consumer-facing AI. Is that fair to say? Exactly. Exactly. Um, terrific. So uh, now the AI Act, being a landmark piece of legislation around the world, has attracted a great deal of attention. Uh, some of the debate is, is quite heated. Uh, and so can you just sort of help us understand, uh, you know, what are the sort of stages of this process and what are the major ongoing debates about the EU AI Act? So the way EU works, you yeah. have... <laughs> You have two co-legislators. There's a, you know, we're in Washington, <laughs> D.C., so uh, some no people worries. just don't understand anything outside Congress, the Supreme Court, and the White House. Let's, let, let's walk through the process. You, sure. have, you have the commission, uh, which has the right of initiative, so they come with this proposal. That's why I keep making reference to the commission, initial commission proposal. So the commission puts forward a text and says, you legislators, here it is. I have initiated because I believe that this is a piece of legislation that is important for the EU. Then the two legislators, council, which represents the governments of the member states, and parliament, which is the only directly elected body of the union, they are the legislators. And they need to basically work together for every piece of legislation that comes out of the EU. So the initial stage, the two institutions work independently of each other. And we are at the stage right now. It's vaguely so the, analogous to the House and the Senate in the US side, although plenty to, of differences. To a certain extent. Yeah. So right now, the council is working in its corner with the governments of the member states to arrive to what is called a common position of the council. So the diplomats of the member states with the knowledge of AI, they meet and they, under the lead of the rotating presidency of the council, right now the Czech Republic, and they arrive, hopefully by the end of this year, to a final common position of the council. We in parliament, we are a political body, we have political groups uh, represented uh, from left to right, and 
we assign at the start of such a process, we assign a rapporteur, so someone who leads the work on the parliament side. In this case, it's myself and my co-rapporteur, Brando Benefe from the Social Democrats. We have to work with all the political groups and find ourselves, at our level, a common position of parliament, which means basically taking the text, drafting it according to our own political vision of what this text should or should not be. So we have a carte blanche. We can play with the text as we see fit, as long as we have a majority of the political groups that support that vision. And then at the end, we have a vote in the committees responsible, and then a vote in the plenary of the parliament. And once that vote is through, then you have the common position of parliament. Once you have these positions, then the parliament, represented by the rapporteur, and the council, represented at the political level by the uh, presidency that holds the rotating pres uh, presidency of the council, then they start meeting in what is called a trilogue. And that's when the negotiations between parliament and council start. And then it's anyone's guess how long it takes. <laughs> in this particular case, I hope that we will be wrapping it up by the end of 2023. Uh, and that's how European legislation is made. At, at this moment, with this text, we are, as I said, at the phase where in Parliament we, are, we have started already the political consultations and the political negotiations between the various, the various groups. We're making good progress. The ambition is to finish ourselves by the end of the year. Finish the Parliament's work. Finish the Parliament's the work. The, uh, the Council has a similar agenda. So they also wish, uh, and I think it's possible, that they wrap up by the end of the year as well, which means that by January 23, we'll actually start that trilogue work that I was mentioning earlier, which, again, I hope will take about a year, given the complexity of the text and also the need to constantly go back to each constituency, because everyone, uh, even if, you, uh, if you're negotiating on behalf of that whole institution, you constantly need to go back and then readjust, yep. and like every negotiation, is going to be a complex process. So there's a ton of momentum behind this legislation, not least because of the leadership that you've shown in driving it. So I think it's, it's extremely highly likely that some version of this is going to pass, but the exact sort of uh, text of the legislation is sort of an ongoing debate. So can you help us understand, you know, what are some of the, the major debates taking place right now around the EU AI Act? I think it's important to, 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 to start with the, with, the, with the first, which is definition. Yeah. The definition what is itself, AI? <laughs> what is AI? That in itself has stirred quite a lot of debate, uh, and it's still quite uh, quite open to to changes in the coming weeks and yeah, months. Yeah, because you know, a company, the marketing department wants everything to be AI, but the regulatory department, when they see AI is regulated, will well, clearly nothing, nothing is AI. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. no. And the the commission itself, in its first proposal, produced a very generic definition of AI. Uh, which some critics said was too generic. It was more or less like trying to define software mm -hmm. in general. And that was more or less not serving the purpose of having a precise uh, scope of the text on actually what is AI, what differentiates AI from regular software. The EU does not have a software regulatory agency. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, you have now two different views the, um, in the two different parts of the house, politically, ideologically one part that supports the idea of a broad or broader definition, kind of a catch-all type of definition with the logic that what is important, in fact, is how you define those precise use cases, those precise applications that fall under the category of prohibited applications or higher risk or those requiring transparency. And therefore, they say, uh, you can afford to have a very broad definition, and others who believe that in fact it should be a more narrow definition, more precise in scope, because that will help also uh, innovation, will help companies being predictable and, and knowing what is and what is not uh, coming out of the scope of regulation. I think what is important here, and that's uh, something we haven't discussed, but, but maybe we touch upon the issue of what actually happens at the global, at the global stage. I think what we need to do with this definition is get as close as, as we can to those definitions that are already used by other like-minded partners and in other multilateral fora where work was done on AI, such as, for example, OECD, which has its own definition, which is widely accepted as a good definition of AI. And I think that is going to serve the purpose of convergence. 
Uh, and as a union, uh, even if we like to think that, well, we're setting models, we're bestowing models upon the world of how we do legislation, we did it with GDPR, so why not doing it with AI? I think this time around, we have to look at it differently. We have to look at the Brussels effect differently uh, and understand that it is important that from the way we design this legislation, we need to be closer to our partners, closer to what should be the prevailing global vision of how this technology needs to be regulated and how the rules need to look like if we want indeed this model to be a model that inspires others. So I think that from the way we design this definition uh, is something that is going to set a, send a signal. Then um, other big political debates are going to be on the, on the definitions of the prohibited practices. So what prohibited practices we put in and out. I mentioned predictive policing. It was not initially in the uh, proposals of the Commission were added later by us in Parliament, for example, and I think, I feel that most political groups will want to keep that in. Um, there's, of course, uh, a discussion on uh, what will end up in the annex of high-risk applications. Understandably, there are a lot of interests that, that want to carve themselves out yeah. of the list. Uh, so that they escape regulations and uh, again uh, there's going to be quite a, quite a debate on, on which will make the final cut and which, it, and which won't. And then there's a lot of discussion on the kind of conformity assessments that you will have. Right now the text proposes self-assessment and I believe in that. I'm going to, to continue to advocate can, for self-assessment. Can self -assessment. you just, uh, expound that a bit on what these assessments are and how that, they relate to the regulations? That means that I am responsible with, with checking compliance uh, with the rules myself. I don't have to go outside and, and bring a, a certification body to, to uh, because that means an additional burden. Mm -hmm. And with the logic that we want this legislation to be as burden-free as possible for companies because we want to encourage innovation, because we want AI to be powering up our economies and not actually be a drag. Uh, so in that logic, self-assessment, something that the companies take upon themselves to, to, to do, is something that I believe uh, serves both the purpose of, of having the rules on AI, but also, again, uh, allowing companies to, to, to do this themselves. Uh, there are others uh, in Parliament who believe, actually, that you need third-party assessment because that gives additional guarantees that compliance actually happens. Mm -hmm. So, again, my role will be to find a balance between these. Right. I mean, I mean, in in many industries, third-party assessment is a big deal and an important deal. I think about airplane manufacturing. But if you're thinking about, you know, a small AI startup with three employees, regulating them the same way that you would regulate an airplane manufacturer with third-party assessments, uh, might or might not be a good fit, right? Depending on the, the nature of the application. Yeah. Um, so we're running low on time, and I did want to uh, get back to what you said about the international dimensions of this. Mm -hmm. You know, with GDPR, uh, there were many in the European Union who were really excited about the so-called Brussels effect, whereby European Union legislation would sort of have a, a ripple effect across legislative approaches throughout the world. Um, you mentioned that you want a different approach for this one, and I just want to commend you and thank you for coming to Washington, D.C. and for all of your prior engagements and cooperation uh, with the United States and other like-minded partners. Which sort of brings me to my question. Um, it seems extremely likely that the European Union is going to be first in terms of major horizontal AI regulatory legislation. Um, the U.S. will probably have a different approach. Other countries like Japan might have a different approach, but what do you believe is, is worth being common? What are the aspects of AI regulation where it really is important to cooperate and collaborate between like-minded partners? I think the fundamentals need to be aligned. I always say that we operate with the same values, and I think that's what differentiates uh, us from those that understand, in a way, the role of technology in society differently. And I think that if we have these values aligned, if we have the fundamentals aligned, already the first step is there. And I'm confident that that happens already, and I think it was affirmed already as part of the first legs of the transatlantic uh, TTC, the Trade and Technology Council. Uh, so we've made sure that, again, the bedrock on which we build rules, standards, future work on AI is, is, is a shared bedrock. Then the second thing, it's, it's, it's almost like the extremes, <laughs> is the standards. So at the next level of granularity, you get the principles aligned, you get the values aligned. The next thing that we can do in common is standards, because we understand that in between, what is in between, cannot converge because we simply have different traditions in how we write norms. We in Europe, we write these norms. We, we, we 
we rush with legislation. Some say it's good, some say it's bad. But that's our tradition. Here, uh, that impulse is not the same. It's mm -hmm. different. But I think that even if the form uh, differs, even if normatively we're not going to have the same products, as long as the values are shared and as long as we will work together on standards so that our companies, whether on the left or the right side of the Atlantic, will actually develop their applications of AI working with, with similar standards, I think the overall objectives are going to be met. And then, of course, we will have to replicate that work with other like-minded partners around the world because it's not only Europe and, and the US in this game. We have Japan, we have Australia, we have India, we have South Korea, we have all those other democracies that again share the values, they share the bedrock, and with which we're going to have to also uh, work uh, together on, on standards. So we'll have to s figure out a way to open up uh, this common work that we do right now under the TTC on standards also to them, to create the frameworks, the governance for it. Uh, because I think that if we manage to do that, then we're going to have a model of how the rules for the future AI in the world is, a model that will be befitting for all of the uh, democracies uh, out there in the world. That's great. So uh, I just have one final question for you, which is um, imagine it's, it's sort of 10 years from now and you're asking yourself, let's assume the EU AI Act has passed in some form. Uh, in, in 10 years, what would you be looking for as the evidence of success or failure? What would tell you whether or not it worked as intended? I think it's going to be how comfortable we will all be as individuals with the world around us. Because the world around us is going to be pretty much powered up by AI. That's inevitable. But I think, uh, again, the level of comfort that we will have and the adaptation that we will have to that new society, to that new digital society around us with its new rules in terms of human interaction, in terms of interacting with the, with the, with the public sector, with our governments, with our local authorities, in the way we're going to interact with the, with the companies, with the private sector. So all that new world in which we're going to live is going to a place that will be fitting with our um, interests and, and our desires and our aspirations if we get these rules right. So if, in a way, we don't allow technology to maybe grow in directions that are not, again, uh, responding to those expectations we have. And this is what I think sets us apart from other models, and we have to be aware of that, from other models of using technology which are not in the interest of, of citizens. AI that is being used to control society, to control citizens, to put them in different boxes uh, according to the interests of the government and not according to the interests of the individual. So uh, because we have these very different opposing models, uh, again, we have an interest to, to set the course for how this technology evolves, a course that, again, fits with, with our vision of, of the world. And I think if in, te if in 10 years' time we're there, and if we are satisfied with the world we live in, it means that these rules and these standards, we did a good job writing them up. Uh, Mr. Chudorake, thank you so much for coming to Washington, D.C. and spending the afternoon here at CSIS. Uh, I wish you good luck in the trialogue and the remaining negotiations in the parliament. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. And uh, that concludes our event here at CSIS. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.